You are listening to Sean Kelly Interviews, a presentation of Sean Kelly on Movies at www.skonmovies.com. Now, here is your host, Sean Kelly. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Sean Kelly Interviews. And today I will be uh, playing for you my interview for You Might Be the Killer, which was the uh, closing film of this year's Toronto After Dark Film Festival. And the film is now available for streaming on Shudder. So I got to speak with the director, Brett Simmons, and also the lead star, Fran Kranz, who you might recognize from various Joss Whedon properties such as the television show Dollhouse and the film Cabin in the Woods. So I had a very good talk with them about You Might Be the Killer. Uh, I should probably advise that this interview does get a bit spoilerish towards the end, so if you want, you can go to Shudder and watch the film and then come back and listen to the interview. Otherwise, here is my interview for You Might Be the Killer. Okay, let's get started. So, um, I was actually um, reading up on the film, and it said, like, the press release said, um, the film was born in a Twitter feed, so yeah. could you um, talk a bit about that? It was born <laughs> on Twitter. Like, it's weird. It's, um, it's as far as I know, it's the first movie based off Twitter, but I, I, I never knew that we were going to be basing movies off of Twitter, so I didn't know it was a race that we were trying to win, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, it was based off a Twitter conversation. Uh, Chuck Wendig and Sam Sykes, two uh, really talented, amazing authors, like they, they just were riffing with each other online and had this 60-tweet long conversation about uh, one of them being stuck at a summer camp, plagued with a serial killer, and the other one just trying to be his buddy, trying to coach him out of the situation. And um, that got optioned by the producers. And then uh, my call was to, uh, the call to me was to figure out how to adapt it and turn it into music. Okay, so um, uh, how did um, Fran get involved? Well, I got I got the screenplay um, and got on the phone with Brett. That was sort of the first step. I mean, I loved the script. It was really, really funny. The challenge, I thought, was to how do we make sure that this movie that's already so kind of consistently packed with jokes and kind of relentless in that sense, how do we make sure that the audience stays invested in it also as a horror film, you know, that it has real stakes. Uh, and so we both were kind of on the same page immediately, you know, Brett was like, I don't want it to be a, a, a comedy sketch of, of like a horror spoof, right? So it, I think we, we talked a lot about pace, you know, and just keeping that sort of energy that the film begins at, you know, it begins sort of in the third act of, of, of another horror film. Yeah. You know, the structure of this movie's all sorts of sort of messed up and original. And, uh, you know, it, it was a challenge to sort of sustain that intensity uh, but but keep the comedy and keep the jokes landing. So we just kind of checked in with each other throughout the shoot, through in between takes, in between scenes, just always sort of making sure we felt like we were intuitively keep being truthful to sort of to, to what what we thought the tone of this movie needed to be. So I just want to talk about um, also Allison Hannigan's yeah. involvement with the film. Um, was um, her stuff shot later and um, did um, was Fran, how did the co- phone conversation show? Fr- like Fran come together? Yeah. Um, what's really funny is Fran and Allison were never actually on screen together once, which is funny. And I like Fran's talked about it. Like he, he did come to set and read off the camera for a scene, but ultimately, like it was something that Allison knew what to do and Fran knew what to do, and they didn't really need each other to sell the chemistry that ultimately they were creating, which was unbelievable for me to witness because I was watching it happen like one side at a time but Allison's uh, all of her scenes were shot in the dead middle of the schedule and so she was able to reference some of Fran's um, scenes via dailies for only really half of his conversation and then the last half of her role was having to basically react to nothing um, but there was just enough of a rhythm and a sense of what Fran was doing that she just really knew how to how to interpret it and 
turn it into something that felt like a real relationship. Um, but yeah, she was always in the comic shop. She was never at the camp or the woods. <laughs> she saw limited dailies. And uh, it's amazing to me how well it works because the chemistry is really powerful. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's surprising. I mean, obviously, you shoot a phone conversation. I'm familiar with this and have done this lots of times in movies or TV shows. You know, you don't work with people. Um, and when you shoot the two different sides of a, a phone conversation, but for something like this and a 90 minute feature, it's strange that it's sustained for that long so successfully. So yeah, it's certainly a tribute to Allison, and I have to say myself as well. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, uh, but it's also, I, I mean, it says a lot to the editing and Brett and being able to construct this conversation to feel so seamless and uh, familiar or friendly, you know? I mean, the chemistry's created in editing, really. Um, so is it just a co coincidence that you happen to cast two people primarily known for Joss Whedon properties? <laughs> Honestly, 100% it was. Like, it was something that came up after the fact when we started, like, kind of putting together our press where, like, that question came up and I was like, oh my god, I didn't even really, like, think about it. You know, like, my, my, uh, I really wanted Fran for the role because I've been a fan of Fran for a while and he just was who I had in mind for the role when it finally came time to try to figure that out. And then uh, Chuck, real life Chuck Wendig is not a female, but we had been um, kind of brainstorming the idea of making Chuck a female because of just wanting to have a, a strong female voice in the movie. And um, and as soon as we went down that road, Allison came to mind and I never honestly connected the two. And I'm, I, I'm probably really stupid for not having connected the two, but <laughs> I didn't. We both went to the um, uh, horror, Joss Whedon Horror Comedy School. <laughs> the finishing school, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, so, well, we had no, all, the, all the ways to deliver lines. So, well, speaking of Joss Whedon, how would you compare um, You Might Be a Killer to your previous work on Cabin in the Woods? I, I, I mean, I'd get, obviously there's, there's similarities being that they're horror comedy, they're sort of uh, self-aware kind of genre-bending films. Um, but as characters, I see them uh, very, very differently. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun playing the, the Marty role because I, I sort of I felt like I had real liberties to be a little cartoonish and charactery, whereas the other four actors, younger actors, had to be. I thought I felt they needed to be more grounded, despite them sort of behaving in the sort of conventional uh, ways that you see sort of characters make bad decisions in horror films and Marty gets to be self-aware or, or, or sort of aware that something's not right I, as, a, as a character I kind of went big with him whereas Sam I tried to play you know naturally you know, and, and really ground the character because he exists with all the comedy around him and it was important that he needed to be for lack of a better word the straight man you know so, so I, I, I found I, I think of them as very, very different. Despite I, I, I understand like the genre being similar, but I, I, I think what what happens in you might be the killer. The challenge, like I said, is in making sure these stakes feel real. You know what I mean? And whereas um, I think at a certain point in Cabin in the Woods, uh, the, the 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 characters you get to you sort of get to enjoy them. Uh, behaving sort of poorly or stupidly in a sense that I thought I, in some ways as great as the movie is the stakes matter less at a certain point in that movie because they're falling into sort of traps being set for them <laughs> uh, whereas with the like I said with the Sam character I think there was much more grounded in a, a sort of reality <laughs> so um so um what gave you the um, idea for the kind of like memento style factor narrative in the film for other than the obvious reasons of not revealing too much right away yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know that really I can't really take too much credit because that, that really just stemmed from a Twitter conversation because that's how the Twitter conversation um, played out it very much started with Sam being in the third act of a would-be horror movie and then um, Chuck by nature of trying to investigate how to help asking I need you to I need you to run by me like what's happened and what's led up to this point so the structure was really almost automatic. It was more just a matter of how do we use it in a in an effective way and keep the story clear and also manage all these deaths in a production way that we're not <laughs> losing our minds telling the story out of order. So, um, in, a, in a similar vein, I, I kind of liked how you kept track of where you were in the story by the death count. Yeah, that's so, awesome. <laughs> so what were your major challenges with the film? 
Um, it was physically it was a very grueling shoot. Uh, you know, we were shooting in Louisiana in the summertime. I mean, it's hot, it's humid. I'm covered in blood, running around, screaming. Um, the, the, there's flashbacks in the film where you get to meet Sam before all the action and horror starts to take taking place. So those would be sort of the relaxing days. But otherwise, <laughs> it's tough. It is, you know, films take a while. And, and to play at, like you said, you know, the movie begins in the third act, you're sustaining uh, an intensity that in a lot of films only plays out for maybe the last 20 minutes of a film. So we were sustaining this essentially kind of over a 90-minute narrative. So there was it was it was it was tough in that sense, very physically demanding. But we had so much fun. I mean, we laughed a lot. It made it had a lot of lot of fun ad living and making things up on the fly and sort of just enjoying this the, the comedy and the script. You know. Okay, so I'm actually running out of time, so I'll just quickly go to the last question, which is um, the, the film um, hints kind of like at a sequel, so are, are you planning to possibly follow up? Oh, there's no plan yet. Um, to be honest, we only barely just finished this one like for five weeks ago, so, like, <laughs> and then we went straight into festivals, so I, I, I've really just been trying to soak up just everyone's response to the, the movie as it stands. Um, it very much does try and set the audience of flight with, you know, just put their imagination of flight for where the sequel could go. Um, I just didn't want Sam to be dead, so I just needed a way for the movie to die, for end where Sam was able to be alive despite the consequences of everything that he's been involved with. And so the ending really represents me having my cake and eating it too more than teasing a sequel. Um, but, I mean, if there was a demand for it, that would be a fun place to go and kind of figure out what to do. Okay. And I'd be down. <laughs> yeah. And that was my interview with Brett Simmons and Fran Kranz about the film You Might Be the Killer. As I said at the start of the show, uh, the film is now available for streaming as a Shutter exclusive on the uh, or a film streaming service, which you can find at www.shutter.com. And that's it for this episode, and I'll see you next time. Sean Kelly Interviews is a production of Sean Kelly on Movies and is hosted by Sean Kelly. The music is Out of the Fog from the website podsummit.com. You can support Sean Kelly and get bonus podcasts at patreon.com slash skonmovies. And you can read Sean Kelly's writing at www.skonmovies.com.